so welcome, everyone. Thanks uh, for your patience. We obviously are, are waiting on uh, one more uh, of our speakers who will hopefully be joining us momentarily. But we wanted to get our conversation underway, recognizing everyone's time. So again, I'm Nicole Golden. I'm the director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, which we launched last year in partnership with the International Youth Foundation. And very, very thrilled to be joined today by a very uh, unique and diverse and uh, very distinguished panel of guests. To my far right is Maury Teherapur. She's the Senior Advisor for Sport and Development at USAID, and she is also um, a professor at the Wharton School. Um, and obviously, you all have your, the full bios in front of you and, and can learn more about her uh, very illustrious background. Um, to my right, Brendan Chewy is a co-founder and president of Peace Players International, um, an organization really at the forefront of uh, engaging young people in sport for peace and development. And we're really excited to, to hear more from him about um, not only their work, but just his thoughts on um, our, our key theme of more than medals. And uh, to my left is Rebecca Zilberman uh, with the British Council. She's the lead for Global Society and Partnership. Um, and um, as you'll hear more about, the British Council has been doing a lot of work related to um, engaging young people in sport um, and, and cultural affairs. And then, of course, um, we'll be very, very thrilled when uh, hopefully Tom Dolan, uh, two-time Olympic champion, uh, swimmer from uh, the Atlanta Games and the Sydney Games, uh, uh, inductee into the International Swimming International Hall of Fame, um, will be able to join us and, and lend his perspective as someone that lived and, and breathed this all, so to speak. Um, so with that, as, as many of you know, who in the room has Olympic fever? I, I expected a lot more hands to go up. Um, so, so the games are underway, and I think um, it goes without saying um, that sport really touches, I'm sure almost everyone in the room has an experience uh, with the, the thrill of victory, as they say, or the agony of defeat. Full disclosure for me, it was much more experienced with the <laughs> agony of defeat than the thrill of victory. Um, but I took my interest in sport from maybe being um, a not so successful uh, player to uh, a very, I'd like to think, successful uh, fan and spectator. Um, but as I you know, work in the development and, and foreign policy space, and in particular in the, in the youth development, um, space, um, when I think about sport, when I think about the Olympics, it, it's taken on probably an additional meaning. Um, I've seen and, and, and watched and with great interest how sport um, and the sport for peace and development movement, if you will, has, has grown. Um, and you know, we've had a number of conversations here at, at CSI, at the Youth Initiative, about um, thinking in the context of you know, global youth unemployment where different tools and platforms and solutions for imparting life skills or soft skills into young people um, in, in, in innovative ways. And I've seen sport increasingly come up um, in that conversation um, in addition to, of course, the Olympics conversation that many of us are having now around um, engaging you know, young people and, and really just sport in general as a tool to, to bring people together. Um, I love this quote I'm going to read before um, turning it over to my panel from, uh, from Nelson Mandela. Some of you might have heard it, but um, if you'll just indulge me quickly. Uh, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to unite in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they can understand. Sport can create hope where there was once only despair. It is more powerful than governments in breaking down racial barriers. It laughs in the face of all types of discrimination. So um, I think you know, I can't say it any um, you know, better than that. And I'm really just excited to, have, uh, to, to get a conversation underway. So with that, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brendan first um, to sort of take that opening and just the, tell us what was behind Peace Players International. What, what brought it together around this you know, sport for peace and development space? Sure. Um, well, I grew up in Washington, uh, probably about five miles down 16th Street, and grew up probably like most of the people in this room here playing sports. And you know, on the playground or the playing field, it didn't matter what color you were or what religion you were, the question was, you know, could you play? 
and in, yeah, in, uh, throughout my growing up and then in high school, um, our school, my two younger brothers, our school was basketball. And ended up playing in college and getting the opportunity to play in Ireland, uh, in Dublin, Ireland. And while I was there, we went to Gonzaga High School, and every few years, the team did a service trip somewhere. And my youngest brother was a senior on the team. I thought, hey, why not, uh, why not Ireland? And where I was in Dublin was about two hours south of Belfast, Northern Ireland, where most of you probably are aware there's been a long-standing conflict between the Protestant and Catholic communities there. And kids are divided by the neighborhoods they live in, the schools they attend, and even the sport that they play. But basketball was the one real neutral sport. It's fairly new. It's more seen as an American sport than anything, but neither the Protestant or Catholic community felt like the other side owned it. So the idea was to do some coaching clinics for Protestant and Catholic kids, the high school uh, players and coaches helped run them. And we had a great week. Um, and you, know, you bring kids together, even at, in a, initially for the short term, and you mix them up and you say, compete, win, Again, who I'm passing the ball to has a lot less um, relevance than, hey, can this person help me win? Can this person score? Uh, so kind of long story short, uh, my brother ended up graduating from college and ended up in Belfast doing something similar. And he came back in 2001 with the idea to, to start an organization using sports to bring people together. And I was 24. My brother was 22. You know, typical, you know, Naive American, <laughs> a white man, right? Thinking, all right, let's, we can do this. Uh, so my dad's a lawyer. He helped us become a 501c nonprofit. We raised about $7,000 from our family and friends. And my brother showed up in Durban, South Africa, um, with a few connections he had made with a police chief he had befriended in Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I had another job. I kind of helped advise him on the way. And you know, my brother's a pretty, he's a fearless kid. Um, and people really like them, so we'd start knocking on doors, white schools, black schools, and where we were in Durban, in a big Indian population. And uh, in, in, in South Africa, unlike Northern Ireland or, or, or in the States, there's no like, red tape. So you can go knock on a school door and they say, not who are you, do you have certification, you know, what do you want, please come, come and coach my kids. Um, so after a while, he was able to convince a, a white principal um, Again, in South Africa, like Northern Ireland, black kids grow up playing soccer, white kids grow up playing rugby and cricket. Um, but basketball, is, it's not that popular, so kids feel comfortable coming and playing together. So we're able to convince a, uh, a principal at a white school to have a match with a township school. And the guy was crazy enough to do it. Um, it had never happened in the history of South Africa where kids from a white school went into a township. So South African Broadcasting Channel was there and filmed it. And they're on the bus. Um, with these kids who had never, you know, hardly you know, much been out of their, their neighborhood, um, you know, much less been to a township. Um, and the kids are scared. Uh, you can see, see the fear in their eyes. <laughs> you get off the bus, and it's not just the school. Like, the whole township area, like that neighborhood is out there waiting for them. They get off the bus, and everyone gives them a huge stand ovation. The captains exchange flags at half court, and they mix them up. And the South Africa Broadcasting Channel was, was interviewing kids and coaches and some parents afterwards, and everyone was pretty much saying the same thing. You know, I was scared, didn't know what to expect, and now I can't wait for it to happen again. So I think that was really the aha moment. You know what, I think we can do this. Let's really scale it up, become um, you know, a real organization. Now it's a lot tougher than it sounds, you know, particularly around raising money, and developing partnerships, and learning how to you know, do everything that needs to be done and to work you know, in order to run and, and grow a successful nonprofit. But that was, so we had, I mean, there was all these moments but once I think that hit, we thought, you know what, we're really on to something. So we went back to Northern Ireland the next year uh, as our own organization and then started in Israel in the West Bank in 2005, uh, Cyprus 2007, and then a year ago launched uh, a Train the Trainer uh, technical assistance program that now works in lots of different places. That's great. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some of that, you know, in that initial intro, it's a really interesting backstory, which I actually hadn't heard, so I'm glad to, <laughs> glad to get it. Um, you know, you say you bring young people together um, on the field, and it's about teamwork, it's about working together. I, you know, it's not a function of who I'm passing it to, it's just the fact that they're going to be there, and they're, you know, my teammate or they're my opponent. Um, on, the, on the youth development side, and getting back to this idea of the workforce, I think some of the other skills that we think about um, that are increasingly being spotlighted as being developed through sport, whether it's, you know, communications, um, discipline, the idea of, um, time management, 
um, again, working together, um, language skills to a certain degree. And I know that while you know, British Council isn't an international development organization per se, um, has really been engaged in a lot of sport programs, um, and particularly with young people. Mm -hmm. um, one that I'm personally very, um, that I'm following quite closely has been the Premier Skills uh, Program, um, which is a partnership with the English Premier League um, using football, or mm -hmm. dare I say soccer. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe it's the other way around, soccer, dare I say football, um, to sort of really translate some of these, you know, life skills um, that are going to prepare young people for success off the field. So I wanted to sort of turn over to you, Rebecca, for a little more on, on what you've seen in that, and then I want to go to Maury for some broader observation. Excuse me, Rebecca, thoughts? Sure. So the British Council, uh, for those who don't know, are, we are the UK's cultural relations organization. And essentially what we mean by cultural relations is we build trust by creating opportunities. And we do this through a variety of different areas, um, bringing the assets of the UK together with assets from other countries. Um, and one of the key areas is, of course, through sport. Um, we have two very large programs that we've been running since 2007, the one that Nicole mentioned, uh, which is still ongoing, called Premier Skills and um, the 2012 Olympic Legacy Program that we've been working on in partnership with UNICEF, UK Sport, the, U the Youth Sport Trust, and a charity called IN called International Inspiration. Um, that program began in 2007 with a goal to reach, uh, or excuse me, affect the lives of 12 million people in 20 countries by 2014, and I'm pleased to say we've surpassed that. Um, and Premier Skills so far has trained 2,300 community coaches in the 20 countries that it's been operating. Um, and that training model has then cascaded to reach the lives of 500,000 young people. Um, Premier Skills, actually, we just um, announced the next phase of the program. So we're running it till 2016 in partnership with the Premier League. Um, and one of the key goals for us is uh, a minimum participation of 50% girls and women in the program. And I can talk about that in greater detail later. But to go back to skills and what we've seen so far in some of the young people that have participated, um, you know, we, we set out with a number of outcomes that we're looking to achieve through both of these programs, and it really is around using sport for community development. So building stronger communities by engaging not only the young people who are playing these sports, but also the coaches that come into the program. Because in a lot of countries, um, a number of these coaches see sports as simply sports, as opposed to how you can use sport to teach other skills, like for us, English language, um, as well as things like the soft skills that Nicole had mentioned, timekeeping, attendance, working together, leadership, et cetera. And for a lot of these kids who haven't been exposed to that, all of a sudden their world opens to them. All of a sudden they say, you know, there are options beyond just what I thought was my traditional path, particularly for some of the uh, girls and young women that we've engaged in the program. Great. Well. <laughs> on cue, <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, starting at 11, correct? Yeah, exactly. So we just, just wanted uh, to make sure I was on the right page. The, Everyone's the really early. Yeah, this is a pregame. Yeah, we're early. Um, so everyone, this is uh, Tom Dolan. We gave you a hopefully a nice introduction before your arrival. Um, but we're Very good. obviously thrilled to, that you're uh, able to join us. So thank, thank you. My um, pleasure. Sorry for being late. No worries. Um, we hear there was good luck. Yeah, it's it's not uh, it's not enjoyable driving around out there right now. So it took me an hour and a half to get here from Virginia. So we'll move on from that. We'll move on from that. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've just been. Um, I'm going to come to you in a minute. Give you a chance to get settled. Um, we've just sort of um, heard from Brendan about kind of the history of peace players and the idea of sport being a tool to bring young people together towards outcomes of, of peace and, and friendship, um, and really as a tool of conflict mitigation. Um, then heard from uh, uh, from Rebecca a little bit on the skill side of sport. Um, I'm going to turn to you in a minute, but first I'm going to go to Maury. Um, as you've been in this space for some time, you've been at USAID now for about three years, and I'd be curious to hear from you as how you've seen sport for peace and development grow. You know, you really sort of your leadership. We were lucky. I was lucky enough to be Maury's colleague at USAID for some time. Um, has you know, focused on new partnerships and, and really elevating the conversation around sport, um, and in particular, sport for development um, and the connection to the youth piece. So I'd love your thoughts, and then I'm going to turn back to you as somebody that lived and breathed it all. 
So I should um, probably say that the development space was very new to me. I worked in sports prior to coming to um, USAID and did a lot of athlete development work, worked with professional athletes in their education and sort of helping them transition out of their careers. Uh, so development was, was new, and I think in a lot of ways I've learned a lot through this journey as well. Um, I should say that while my role is fairly new at USAID, uh, sport is not something that is new to USAID. Our missions around the world have funded um, sports uh, programs for probably as long as we've been around, honestly, and um, more so in countries where there's a really strong sport culture. Um, so that, that sport becomes part of the DNA of the community and therefore um, it becomes a really valuable tool for that community to use to um, integrate it into ch childhood education and development and so on and so forth. Uh, Nicole had previously asked me to talk about sort of trends a little bit as well and what I've seen during this time. Um, growth. There's, uh, there's a lot of organizations that sort of pop up, um, Brendan knows this all too well, um, who are very passionate about sport, which is the thing that it does, is it creates this passion and um, uh, people want to use uh, this opportunity to actually create sort of a positive behavior change among youth and communities. So we've seen a lot of that. We've seen a lot of new organizations. Um, so the, the good side of that is that there, are, there is sort of this effort to really use um, sport as a vehicle for, for change. Um, the sort of not so good side of it is that it creates a lot of fragmentation. Um, and as a result, uh, we see a lot of organizations also come and go. Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy. It takes more than just passion um, to, to put an organization together. Uh, to my left sits, uh, sits Brendan, who really has one of the leading premier um, NGOs um, in the space, um, and for a number of reasons, and, and so I'm going to talk about you a little bit. Um, but, but the reason why peace players, and I think it's a great example to use, um, is that the, you know, previously, we all know in this room that, that sport um, has a lot of positive attributes, obviously. And for years, um, it, we talked about it having sort of positive impacts with respect to physical um, and psychological sort of impact on kids. And, and it was a great thing for kids to be involved in. I think over the past few years, um, it's become more of a serious conversation around sport where we're really looking at it not just from those two perspectives, but how to use this as a vehicle to create um, behavior change as well, which is not an easy thing to do, obviously, um, and sustainable behavior change at that, curbing negative behaviors. You know, so there's like the positive behavior change model, and then there's that that says, and we're going to dissuade you from doing neg negative things, from bad things. So um, we see it in a lot of Latin America, um, violence prevention in youth using sport as a vehicle for change. Um, peace players, what I think is really important about the organization is that they've done a remarkable job, not just delivering the services, but really looking at sustainable change in these kids. Um, and we all know, especially in development, I mean, Rod Shaw, who's our, our administrator, often talks about sustainable development, that this, in fact, if you want to create change, um, this is not a you know, one time go in, drop and do a program leave, and, and that's it. That really, to create this sort of long-term behavior change, you see um, the impact of this work over time. How do you do that? You do a tremendous amount of um, evaluation work. So really robust evaluation model that's associated with these programs. Unfortunately, some of these organizations that don't have the wherewithal to do it, with, whether it's funding, whether it's staffing, often can't really show that. Um, and many people actually think that there isn't a lot of evaluation work in this area. There really is. There's actually a tremendous amount of it. But just as I talked about that fragmentation, it, it leads to the same thing in the evaluations. Um, but what Peace Players has done is actually lead the way for a lot of the other organizations and really for this field in a lot of ways because they have probably the first sort of longitudinal study um, around, around this and, and looking at sort of long-term behavior change. This, in fact, really changes the way we talk about sport in the development space, um, where we take it far more seriously, where it becomes um, equally as important to fund a sport program, I hope, um, as it does to look at other models um, and really integrating sport not as a byproduct of our programs, but really just yet another vehicle, another tool. Um, many people refer to it as the carrot, if you will. If you can't capture the attention of these kids, what do you do? You give them a basketball. Mm -hmm. And through that, then you teach them all their behaviors. So um, I don't know if I directly answered your question, yeah. but I think that's sort of the trend that we've seen is really this becoming a very 
very compelling, very serious um, uh, sort of area um, that we're looking at in development. And I see my colleagues here from the State Department in diplomacy. Um, this is not just fun anymore. I think it's, it's become really a, a very sort of serious, intense conversation around where is the future of sport and development. And I think there's, it was great. Thanks, Maury, because lots of things I want to come back to. Um, but before we do, now that we are lucky to have uh, Tom with us, um, it feels a little silly to ask a two-time Olympic champion to talk about something else other than medals. Um, but you know, in that theme, I mean, how does this resonate with you as somebody that lived it and, and breathed it and you know, was a young person going through sport at this very competitive and international sort of Olympic level? I'd yeah. um, love to sort of just hear the, the personal experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I have a, a unique perspective in that I lived through a lot of even what Maury is talking about. Um, but I think on the other end of it, um, kind of towards the end of my career and post-career, um, doing a lot of work with the United States Swimming and the USOC, um, and also being fortunate to be in a sport that's global. I mean, I think that we, we, we talk a lot about sport being global, but the actual uh, competitive arena that you live in with whatever sport that you may participate in isn't always global. Um, I think I was very fortunate at a, at a young age um, to travel around the world, having no idea what that meant or what I was really doing other than following a black line back and forth. Um, and I think it's a, it's, a, um, it's a funny thing as you move away from that kind of competitive arena um, true in life and with everything that we do and that, man, I wish I knew now, you know, I could go back in time and, and, uh, and, and put it in place. And you find that even within the life cycle of your career. Um, I think you hear it a lot. It's kind of used as a little bit uh, too much of a cliche, but um, I think within your career, you within yourself by say the last 25, 30% of your career have really figured out the game and, and, and can fully appreciate um, your surroundings and all the people that help you get to where you are at an elite level um, and all the amazing volunteers that put the events together. And I think it takes a long time to kind of pull that all together and, and have a, a, a larger scope, if you will, of perspective um, as to what it takes. And then in turn, the trickle down of it is the impact that you yourself have on people. Um, and I think at a young age, in an elite level in any sport, it's very hard to, to fully appreciate that. And in turn, I firmly believe it's very hard then to be impactful because you don't really understand who you're impacting and in what ways you're impacting, be it good or bad. Um, which unfortunately you see a lot in the big time professional sports because there just isn't a connection yet of, wow, it really does make a difference when at simplistic level I stop and talk to a group of young kids um, and, and what they take away from that. And, and, and I think a lot of times it depends on the sport that you're brought up in. I can tell you my personal story is that um, I had a very hard time having those types of conversations. Not, I don't have a hard time talking, but I did have a hard time fully, I think, um, relating to the importance of the messages that, that we as athletes can impart on anyone and everyone. Um, part of that is also, I think, in the world of swimming, it is a very um, similar to rungs on a ladder, very long, um, very vertical uh, climb to get to the elite level. And so there's really no smoke and mirrors in that uh, you know what you've put in to get there, which is also why, knock on wood, hopefully you found most swimmers are very grounded. Um, th there isn't a lot of fluff to the messages because it's, it's very blue collar, hard work. Some might wonder why you would even want to put in that many hours in just look staring at the bottom of the pool for that many years to get to that point where you feel like, hey, this is a good message that I'm passing along to kids. Um, and it's kind of what I'll get to in a second, which is I think what everyone up here is, is aiming for, and that is the life skills that you can impart on, on kids, on youth, um, on, on, on any group of, of um, I think, interested listeners. Um, and that's what sport does. It, it provides life skills. And that's where we have a, a huge divide right now and, and that we need to bridge. And I think Maury did a lot of that, it sounds like, even before um, in working with professional athletes. It's a classic problem that we all have. If you see these 
these people that are massively successful, and they're successful not just because they have incredible physical skills, they're successful because they've figured out how to utilize those to the best of their ability to be better than everyone else in the world. Um, that doesn't just stop it in that one bucket. You can't just compartmentalize that. They're, those skills work for life in a lot of different arenas that have nothing to do with from going from point A to point B in the water. Um, that classic kind of uh, struggle, though, is it, it doesn't just happen. You don't just get that and think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, and I think that's kind of what we're all rooted in, which is you don't have to win an Olympic gold medal to know that life, that life skills come out of working hard and doing something you love and being passionate about it. Um, th the beauty of that is it doesn't matter whether it takes you an hour to get to the other side or it takes you 30 seconds to get to the other side. Um, all of those skills are, are, are still there and, and embedded in you. Um, and so I think for me, it, it was an interesting, uh, I think, kind of step-by-step -step process to, in the beginning, I felt like, well, who am I to, to think that my word matters to people? Because again, I came from this sport that you don't, you don't jump rungs on the ladder, you go step by step, and it takes a really long time, and it's very difficult. No different than any, anything else we do in life. But as a result, at 18, 19 years old, as a world record holder, you don't know what, the, what that means. You don't know what, what does it mean to have a world record. I don't know. I just swam the best time. You don't get that, like, in the history of the world, no one swam faster. The beauty of youth is you have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. At 38, if I knew that at 18, I probably would never get in the water again because I'd be so freaked <laughs> out. Um, but the reality of it is, it does go completely in line then with, then why would I think I would feel comfortable getting up in front of a group of people, whether it's young people or not, and passing along messages? Who am I? I'm an 18-year-old kid uh, or a 20-year-old kid in Atlanta and, um, and, and so on to, to Sydney. And, I think that what, what ends up happening is you go through the, the process of realizing that it's not about you, it's about your message. You don't have to feel like, like some egomaniacal crazed lunatic and saying, listen to me because I'm the only one that's figured this out. You're just giving your perspective on, look, I was fortunate to, to find something that I was passionate about um, and I loved and it wasn't work cliches, but nevertheless, that's how you get out of bed at 4.15 in the morning and get into freezing cold water. It can't be work. Um, and I think you then feel as though, you know what, these messages are more than just, here's how I won. These are messages of, I have now fallen in love with the process, not what that process gets me to. And therefore, all of you can fall in love with that process on whatever path you choose. And I think that's when I started to figure it out in terms of having an impact on young people and having it be much more important than just, hey, here's my gold medal. Do you guys want to look at it? Because it's unattainable. You know, and I think I remember as a little kid meeting professional athletes and Olympians and just thinking it was some far off mystical, magical place that isn't relatable. And in fact, it has nothing to do with how shiny the metal is and everything to do with, well, what, what did you put into it? And I think that's where I'm a firm believer in this idea of it's not as kind of simple as just saying, oh, everyone should, should participate in sport. The idea is, well, what do you get out of that? It's an avenue to have the conversation with them to say, look, it, it, in your mind, this is simplistic because you want to make a basket, right? You, you want to make a three-pointer. And that seems fun. But actually, there are a lot more deep-rooted, uh, huge kind of life skills and, and themes that you can, can, can garner from that that you don't have to understand right now. But as you get older, you will appreciate them. And that's, I think, a lot of what we're talking about. And that's a lot of, of what, I, what I saw. And I guess, you know, just to kind of last, last point, um, is Nicole was kind of mentioning to me, you know, bring your personal experience into it, and then where do you see it now? And I think, I think there's there's kind of three um, three factors right now that have changed from even when I swam, and, and I did a lot of public speaking and a lot of um, working with groups of kids, and I had very bad asthma, and, and so I did a lot of work with um, with pharmaceutical companies, and we then linked into. Um, public school systems around the US. And so I would go on, on um, speaking tours and do 15 to 20 speeches a year where we would go into middle schools and elementary schools and high schools. And it was awesome for me because I could go, I got up and, and spoke after the doctor. And hopefully, I don't know if there's doctors in the room, but I, I apologize <laughs> if there are. I love doctors. I've seen too many of them in my life. 
not the most, uh, <laughs> not the most awe-inspiring public speakers. Um, tend to be a bit dry. And so for me, it was like, even if I couldn't form a sentence, everyone's like, oh my god, this is so much more fun. We're not talking about you know, stale medical side of it and just tell your story about how you struggle with asthma. But I think the interesting part of that is um, it got me in front of, of kids to see the reaction, to see that you had a, a level of accomplishment that they could, they could relate to in the sense that they saw it. They watched the Olympics. They, they love watching the Olympics. And there's a simplistic side to the Olympics that it is the every man's competition of, hey, all of these people, whether they're still kids or now adults, they're just doing what, when their parents let them out of the house when they were five years old, they're just doing that. And I think that's why people love the Olympics, because it's like, man, I, I do that too. Like, when I have free time, I do that. And they've just found that passion to, to, to pursue that. And I think what's changed now um, versus even when I was competing are three things. One, I think there's a, there's a global communication ability now that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago, which has brought this whole space um, and made it feel a lot smaller, um, which is a very good thing. And it becomes a bit more real. The fact that you live in Sweden and love a sport in Sweden, you, it's still relatable to if you live in Australia and love a sport in Australia. Whereas before, that was just, you, you couldn't bridge that. Um, I think the second thing is, is the realization of life skills. Um, I think it's the idea of um, th these aren't just kind of far away, um, I can never touch them, athletes um, or goals um, in, in whatever sport children choose. Um, they are, there are skill sets now, and I think we're all more sophisticated in communicating that to groups of people that there are skill sets that come out of it that become life skills. I think that was never talked about when I grew up swimming. Um, I think that's a huge thing. And I think the third thing is the level of professionalism. I think Maury kind of touched on that. Sorry, I keep re referring to Maury because I came late, and that's, she's the only one I heard so far. But I, I'm sure everyone else we'll had, had awesome <laughs> comments, too, related to that. But um, I think that is the level of professionalism. I think it's very different now. And again, I, I, I would obviously tend to speak more towards the athlete themselves. I think they, they carry themselves uh, in a much more professional manner. And again, I, I would speak more towards the Olympic arena just because that's, that's my world. Um, I, I, am, I, I will forever be impressed with, um, as each year goes by, um, how much more articulate, how much more uh, serious in a professional way our athletes have become. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's very impactful because I think it takes it from a, um, here's just a kid that got lucky, or here's just a super, super talented kid um, that just found their niche. And in that way, in those stories, youth, it's harder for them to relate to that because it's kind of the one-off. It's that, you know, it's the one in a million chance. Whereas I think as athletes become more professional in how they carry themselves, not in the professionalism of their sport, but how they carry themselves um, and interact with everyone, I think kids relate to that more because it becomes a bit more of, here's someone that is really organized in their thoughts, and I, and, and I understand what they're saying. It's not just kind of, it's great to be here, you know, what an honor. But they, there are true messages that, that are linkable and, and actionable, I think, in, in passing along. And, and I think that's, that's helped all of us to be able to then, through organizations that are run more professional, um, I think take it to a different level than it's been in, in say, the last 20 years. Thank you. <laughs> Lots to follow up on and only so much time. Um, but picking up on something, you know, Maury, that you introduced, actually really that the four of you hit on, I, I, I kept, the word that kept coming to my mind and moving from um, the natural, you know, we love sport because we like to play mm -hmm. to the seriousness is, is intentionality um, and the idea of bringing um, intentionality into programs and policies um, and coaching methods um, and preparation of athletes that will make sport be more than just you know, about medal, so to speak, about the competition to get to some of these other outcomes, whether they be peaceful, whether they be skills development, um, you know, or somewhere in between. So I'm wondering, Rebecca, if you can maybe start and sort of pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And, and does that, am I just making up things? Is, does that 
seem sensible, you know, just in, in the way that you've gone about your work? Uh, sure. So I think there, the British Council, because we are engaged in long-term activity, so you, you don't build trust overnight, as all of us know, um, we're very keen on ensuring that we've set the outcomes that we're looking to achieve in place before we start designing a program so that we know that whatever interventions we bring to the table, they work toward achieving those ultimate goals. Now, with our work in sport, it really is around using sport for community development. And in both Premier Skills and International Inspiration, we have worked very hard to, with our partners, ensure that we're engaging on a number of different levels. So you've got the engagement with the participants, certainly. Obviously, they are your target audience. Then you, you obviously want to engage with practitioners. And then finally, um, also engaging at the policy level. And through that, we see that longer term <coughs> systemic change can happen. Now, of course, it doesn't happen overnight. So one example from a policy point of view, um, through the International Inspiration Program, we actually brought a series of, or a group, I should say, of differently abled athletes from Northern Ireland, actually, to Jordan, um, to basically showcase how sport can be used to engage a broader community of young people, so young people that wouldn't necessarily have access to a game of tag, for example. And generally, it wasn't because that anyone wanted to exclude them. They just didn't know how to include them. So as a result of that trip, as a result of showcasing how some of our partner organizations like UK Sport and the Youth Sport Trust were able to pull in curriculum that is much more accessible, um, <coughs> the government of Jordan helped set up a policy including differently abled athletes that was then um, cascaded throughout the country. So that's one large scale policy example of how we've, we've achieved change through working in sport. On a slightly more focused scale, we've, um, through Premier Skills, um, adapted a model that the Premier League has rolled out quite successfully in the UK. In the UK, it's called the KICKS program, KICKS with a Z or a Z, as you say in the UK. Um, and essentially, it's working with Premier League teams to target young people who are um, very heavily at risk. So they're um, in communities with high levels of crime. Um, and this is a very um, in-depth program in that it engages young people three nights a week for an entire year, um, particularly after school when they would obviously get into other, let's say, unsavory activities. And as a result of this, in, in places like Wolverhampton, actually, the, uh, the crime rate went down by 40%. So we've adapted that model in a few key countries where we work with Premier Skills. Um, India is one, working in Calcutta or Kolkata. Uh, we've rolled out a program called Kolkata Goals. And again, it's ensuring that not only are we working with the participants there and sort of coming in with the Premier League, but ensuring that we involve all of the local stakeholders in that community so that they feel that they've got ownership in the program. Uh, so we've worked with the police force there. We've worked with nine local clubs. Um, we've worked with the Parks and Rec um, uh, Department to ensure, again, that they they are all contributing and to the point where we've seen some of the fans of, uh, of the nine clubs in Kolkata coming out and volunteering their time with these kids. So they themselves are becoming mentors and taking ownership. It's really interesting. I mean, you mentioned, Tom, you know, be, being an asthmatic and, and one of the other, I think, uses in the broader international context of sport and peace and development is it particularly use in um, for children and young people and overcoming adversity, whether it's, you know, you mentioned differently abled athletes um, working in refugee communities, um, that, you know, but again, it's this idea of moving from, you know, general, you know, sport and play, let's just put them on the field or put them in the pool, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, how do you design a program to be, you know, with this intentionality and the seriousness, um, to Maury's point, about you know, the outcomes. I mean, Brendan, do you have sort of thoughts on that in, in the spaces where you work? Yeah. Um, and you can, you know, coming from a person, we've made lots of mistakes. <laughs> um, you know, our objective is not to create the best athletes or the best basketball players. It's really around helping young people you know, see the other as human beings, developing friendships, and bringing their families, their peers, their communities into the process. Um, at the same time, if you don't have a strong sports program, if kids feel like they're getting other stuff <laughs> stuffed down, they're not going to like it. They're not going to come back. Yeah. So we, you know, we started out really just being about the sport, 
And that was great where kids were coming together, you know, in this safe space, feeling like, all right, you know, I'm seeing my teammate as a human being, I'm developing friendships, but it ended. Mm -hmm. When they went yeah. back to their home and their community, they were hearing all this other stuff that contradicted what they were, you know, learning through their experience, you know, with us. Um, and then, so we, we got a, actually a really good curriculum partner, the Arbinger Institute, and we developed a curriculum um, that, you know, took their philosophies, and I don't want to get too hokey, but a, a, lot, a lot around seeing each other as humans, about how we put up our own boxes, and this issue of collusion, I do something bad to them, they'll do something bad to me, it gets worse and worse and worse, and we don't know what we're doing. Um, and so we went really heavy on the curriculum part, and it was too heavy. So the kids were like, I don't like this stuff, you're kind of freaking us out. Um, so then we came to the point where, you know what, let's focus on training the coaches the right way and developing, you know, a culture of, of, of respect, of friendship, of understanding that I'm going to have any impact, i got to work on myself first and then go from there. And so that's where we've been for the last four or five years and it's been really, you know, great, it's not perfect. Um, but I think what we're most proud of is that you go to our, our sites and you hear this common language and you see people talking about these players like we do. Um, and so I think what's key, and I think uh, I start, you know, stated before, on understanding what the intentions are, mm -hmm. the objectives are, and making sure that everyone in your program does, so at least you're on the same page. So yeah. I'm saying, my job, although you know, having a winning team of, for example, in Israel, we've got Israeli and Palestinian kids playing together in the National League, and the fact that they're doing really well um, and winning, it just adds, it creates attention. Yeah. You know, other people share a lot of what our work is about making things happen that weren't happened before. And if the broader community is witnessing and saying, not all these kids playing, they're winning, and these kids going into you know, an all Israeli community, all Jewish community, and people like, what are Palestinian kids doing there? And then they're seeing they're winning. And then the Palestinians themselves have always been seen as kind of less than and not having the same resources. They're seeing themselves, hey, I can compete on a level playing field. So the competition part is really, really important. People just have to see that that's not the end goal, but it's a critical part to it. It's really interesting because I mean, you brought up a few points that, you know, I often say in youth development that sometimes a youth program doesn't necessarily have youth in it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about the families, it's about, you know, training coaches, it's about um, preparing adults to better and more effectively engage in creating those relationships. And one of the other pieces, um, you know, that Rebecca, you hit on, and, and Tom, I know you have some experience with from a different perspective, is the idea of participation, the idea of, you know, engaging stakeholders, all of them, um, in the process. And, you know, Tom, you mentioned to me, um, you mentioned here some of your work um, with the USOC, and just the idea of, you know, athlete and stakeholder engagement. I'd be curious to hear, you know, your perspective on how important that is in sort of setting the policy and program, and then from a broader sort of international perspective, you know, Maury, Brendan, Rebecca, how that, that participation piece has been important um, to being more effective. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a great topic. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a tough one to navigate from, from my perspective. Um, to a certain extent, I'll choose my words carefully. Uh, there's, a, there's a history um, that I think for Olympic sports um, it has, has played out over a long period of time that you've seen play out in, in a much um, shorter period of time and at, and at a faster rate in professional sports. And that is, um, what, what word and voice and level of, um, of seriousness and professionalism uh, does, does an athlete have in policy change? Um, historically in the Olympic movement, less than zero. Um, <clears throat> I think that two kind of two things have happened and, and, and the path the pathways have split and they're very different. One is um, in in sports like track and field is a is a really good example. Um, they went the route of saying, you know what, we're not being heard and now we're gonna go our own way. We're actually not gonna um, challenge in-house, if you will, the system. We're going to make our own system, and we'll do it our own way. That's how things like, um, you know, the, through Europe, um, through the summer, 
um, how they have competitions that are really athlete run. Um, and the, the golden, I think it's called, um, I forget the name exactly, but the golden uh, shoe or golden cleat or uh, <laughs> series uh, of meets. And that was born out of the fact that track and field athletes said, wait a second, this is about us. The competitions are about us. The organizations are about us. In other words, who, who cares if nobody is, is running? Um, or who cares if there isn't a quality and professionalism carried out with how they compete? Uh, and I think what's, what's happened in a lot of Olympic sports is it's not about, uh, I think we, we in, in a lot of parts of the US, we view the term professionalism in sports sometimes to be negative because I think um, a lot of people have the, the image of, uh, of athletes just wanting more money and that's what that really means rather than um, professionalism in terms of having a say in policy change in, in, in the effect that it has on your own sport and things like drug testing and who can compete and who can't compete and what are the, what are the boundaries of that and what organizations are testing and, and well, why are these things not allowed and why are these things allowed and why isn't there more transparency to that? That, that kind of argument has gone on for a while now in the Olympic sports. Drug testing is a hot button issue. But the bigger point than that is how are these decisions made and, what, and, and at what point should they be consulted at least with a percentage of voices in the room that are actually athletes living through it or have lived through it now uh, see, see it kind of backwards and, 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 and have a perspective to say, wait a second, you got, nobody understands what you're then putting the athletes through. If the goal is to, and again, it, it does go back to youth as well. If the goal is to have a, a series of, of levels so that along the way within that sport, you are gaining those life skills. And it's, sometimes it's about winning, sometimes it's about losing, it's certainly about competing. And what does that all mean? Are we in agreement then from a policy standpoint that what we're implementing is actually having the effect that what it's meant to have when it's put pen to paper? That's part of the, the, the problem I think that we've had in a lot of Olympic sports is that the intent we may all agree on, how it's actually implemented and carried out, very different. Um, and, and, who, and, and who responds to that? Who says it's different? Well, the athletes are the ones that are living through it. So what is their voice? Um, hasn't happened that way a lot historically because you, you kind of started in a very amateur athletic you know, association way and have morphed from that into kind of the modern day USOC and in defense of the USOC, they still have to listen to the IOC um, who doesn't listen a whole lot. Um, and it's not... I don't view it as negative talk and, and putting organizations down. I do view it as a realistic view of an athlete who's lived through it in both good and bad. And I think one of the things that tends to happen is when the greater population listens to athletes voice their opinion, the incorrect um, kind of response is always, well, those are spoiled athletes that are just complaining. Look how much they've gotten. Well, how do you know what they've gotten? What if it's an athlete that's a fencer that's never gotten one dollar in their career? Um, just because swimming is, is watched more and is more popular than fencing doesn't mean that, does swimming ultimately get more money because they, they get more medals? Yes, in the structure that we currently live in, that's correct. Because there does have to be some level of evaluation. And guess what? We live in a world where evaluation does have to do with performance. It doesn't all have to do with performance, but there is a chunk of it that performance ha that has to come out of that, right? That's how we're all analyzing our jobs. Um, th there is a side to it, though, that I think with, in policy change that um, we've gotten better. Certainly, the USOC has gotten better. The board that I was on was called the Athletes Advisory Council, and it was one athlete from every summer and winter sport. Um, who then had a voice into the USOC board. Um, I certainly think that's a step in the right direction. The USOC board now has a policy that they have to have a certain number of athlete members on the board. Um, tremendous strides from 20 years ago. Uh, I think that what's, what's happened, though, um, that is different than in, say, professional sports is that the power in professional sports is 100% with the athletes. Why? Because they're the biggest names. They're the biggest uh, faces in the media. 
they can pick up a phone and the AP wire will run a story in 15 minutes off of what they said. That's a different ball game than historically what's happened in Olympic sports. That poor fencer out there, the AP wire isn't going to pick up that story um, unless it's a really differentiating story. And that's kind of a harsh reality of, of, of where you know, my time, I think, in, in a lot of those um, organizations was spent on how do we even that playing field so that when we are passing policy and, and agreeing on policy, um, it isn't just a, really directed towards the big Olympic sports that win the most medals. Um, you know, in fairness to the USOC, they're like any other business too. They, everyone has to, ha, has to uh, abide by certain realities. They, they have to publicize the medals that they win and how that all works then in, in terms of money. So we, we get that. It's not to say that we're all so naive that, that every sport is always going to receive the, the, the same amount of attention um, as a result of that. But I do think that um, what you tend to find, and, and especially in the Olympic arena, is it, it is, um, we've gotten better, but it's a very steep hill to climb and big challenge, and that is to, to engage athletes enough while they're competing with their blinders on in their particular sports, in the height of their career, to think about all of these topics um, and to act on them and, and affect change. I think it's a, that's a challenge that I see all groups having um, in terms of, of athlete participation. It's, it's which athletes are participating and where are they in their career um, and what does that mean? And it isn't just you have to get all the big names and faces, but it is about what I started with, which is the people that are in, it, in the trenches at the moment competing are the best ones to talk to about, well, well how, how does that work now? How, how do the, the changes to the Olympic Village help or hurt the athletes now? Because the problem in, in the Olympic arena is that it is such a big arena that when all these changes happen, there's such a delayed response to kind of maybe adjustments made to changes that have been put in place, whether it's policies, whether it's physicality of venues, um, there is such a delay to get back around to it because the current athletes that are competing, I did the same thing, say, listen, all that's well and good, I, I hear you. I've spent 22 years of my life for four minutes. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not going to apologize for wanting to focus 100% of my energy and time on that. I think what you're asking and talking about is great, but here I am. And maybe I can get back around to you when I retire, and then you know, I can and get on those boards. And, and it's helpful, certainly helpful. But I think that's a challenge of um, that, that, that from the bottom all the way to the top, in terms of minute decisions to big, chunky decisions, um, that's a challenge that the Olympic arena has is athlete voices, and then who are the athletes? How involved were they? And what sports were they in? Because maybe smaller sports didn't see all of the different issues and changes that, that, that were affected to a games. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a, it's certainly, we're not, we're not there, but I do think on a, in, a, in a very positive way, we have come a long way. Even if I go back to 1996 in my first Olympics to now, we have come a long way. I, I do think athletes have more of a voice now, and I don't think it's in the superficial way of they make more money and therefore they have a voice. I actually think it's in the professional way of they care and it matters, and the system recognizes that. So going from the, the Olympic arena, right, to more of, say, the asphalt or the, the fields, and I know you're off to Sri Lanka, I think, this week, or you're, you know, working in, you're in, you know, you're in the West Bank. Um, how does that resonate with, in terms of, with, with how you sort of do your monitoring evaluation? We talked a bit about that, Maury, you commented on that, and bringing this field forward in a very real and serious way. Um, and the challenges of you know, engaging participants while they're participating, right? And how, how do you account for that? Um, and does it matter? Have you seen that it matters in you know, the way you design your program, the way you um, talk about your impact? Um, Brendan, you want to thought on that other than Maury? I mean, I, I, I personally think that it all matters. I mean, it's, a, it's a multi-stakeholder approach that's going to change this field. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I, I'm sitting here as I was listening to you, there's a lot of things that I was thinking about, but um, <laughs> I would argue that yes, things have changed, but things haven't changed so much. I mean, you know, when I think about the Olympics, I think about 1968, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Black Power, I mean, and, and the notion of, you know, should these athletes even talk um, about things that are, um, have political significance. And I think that so multi-stakeholder approach is how does the role of the media play into all this? And, and what do we think about um, these athletes with respect to their training and their perseverance and their wherewithal to create change? They have a lot of power, for good or for bad. Then there's, so then there's the media that covers them. So we, all we ever see are the negative stories about these athletes. For once, I would love to turn on the TV and see the NFL players that I know, um, that I have respect, shown in a good light and all the positive things that they do because it is so aspirational. Then there's the role of government, um, that we alone can't do it. Where some of, while we invest a lot of money, we are, our investment is, is um, eclipsed by um, corporate funding. Um, so then you need the corporations who for so long have used sport um, because it is sexy, because it garners attention. Um, but CSR activities, how deep did they go? And now they're look, really looking at um, no longer how many kids do, went through this program and how many eyeballs watched this program and knew that, you know, AB InBev or whoever was the sponsor, they're now saying, we need traction, we need <coughs> metrics that are going to drive this further, um, and so on and so forth. You know, in the U.S., we're seeing the NCAA jump in and looking at, at you know, a variety of different policy changes. Um, anywhere from, you know, still Title IX issues, we're looking at gender equality issues, disability issues, all the way to should professional, should athletes while in college get paid. So we are in that, we are in that sort of, I want to say, um, sort of the perfect storm in a lot of ways because we are recognizing the power of sport, uh, but it absolutely needs a multi-stakeholder approach to create the kind of change that we're talking about. One, one group, one, one sort of uh, lever is not enough to, to create the change. And I think it's really, when we talk about public-private partnerships, and you know, those, those, the word of, <laughs> of the decade, um, it, it's, it's really, all, that's all it is, is how do all these stakeholders come together um, and, and create lasting change using what, what we all know love to be a powerful tool to do so. Brendan, um, any last comments? And then Rebecca, last comments, and then we'll, um go to you for a few questions, so get your thoughts on We don't have too much time for questions, but a few. I think that's actually a great way to transition. All right. So, <laughs> Good. Like, I don't need anything to add. <laughs> Rebecca, any I thoughts? Just I mean, just lots, there's been lots put on the table yeah. between um, Tom and Maury. Well, I think building on what Maury said, answering that so what question, so that you get other stakeholders involved in the process, and that's where the importance of monitoring and evaluation comes in, to be able to say, this intervention actually led to this change in this community, and we have the data to prove it. I think it's very important. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, um, as we go to questions, you know, more one of the, the very well-known sort of, you know, say, leading sport for development programs at USAID, as well as IDB and other support, Aganar, active in, you know, 15 countries in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and they've invested a lot in monitoring and evaluation and, you know, are able to sort of go and say, well, you know, 70% of our program graduates have gone on to get a job, return to school, or, um, or start a business. And that's, that's powerful. And I think the more and more that we're able to, to, to show that evidence, to make that case um, based on actually engaging, you know, participants in a real and serious way, will help sort of move this, this movement, if you will, um, you know, with the seriousness and the intentionality um, that it needs. So we've got time for a few questions. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot more questions than we have time for. So um, we're going to go one, two, and three. We'll take three kind of um, World Bank style, if you will. Um, please keep them brief um, so that um, we will have a, a chance to respond to them or that our panelists will. Hello everyone, I'm Kyle Gibson with the Africa Business Initiative of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you, Nicole, and everyone of having this discussion. Um, I think the message is great, and I'm a firm believer in the role of sports in uh, communication and all the positive benefits. Um, Maury mentioned this, and I think this is kind of um, aimed at Brendan, too, is um, just the role of multiple stakeholders in sports. 
Um, we've seen the rise of Western sports, primarily football and basketball, internationally, um, primarily in Africa, Nigeria and South Africa. Um, and with this globalizing trend comes the American uh, characteristic of a multi-billion dollar industry with entertainment, with sponsorships. And I guess my question to you is, what do you see the role of corporate American um, you know, involvement in these, in these partnerships, whether it's for the better or for the worse? So, thanks. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. Thank you, Nico. My organization focuses on conflicts and res conflicts uh, prevention and conflicts uh, resolution and violence prevention. Uh, we are doing. We do election observations. We did in Kenya. We'll be going to do election observation in South Africa. And what we are focusing on election observation. You know, in Africa, too many violence. My nephew was killed. My son was killed into this election. So I've taken it as an initiative as an observer of election. And I don't only observe election. We get there before the election, working with young people in sports, making them responsible and ownership. So we want to make them busy. We with sports and entertainment. So by the time election comes, there is no violence. So that's one thing we are doing with election. So we don't just observe. And uh, also, we are part of the President Obama initiative for young people, the 500 who will be coming to the United States. And Nico, thank you so much. I'll bring some of them here. So yeah. I'll let you know. And Brandon, you live across my house. Uh, Konzaka does a lot of work to the community and helps the community so much apart from their sports. So my question is, how do you work with us? And I, by the way, I come from Kenya. You know Kenya is soccer and sports running and up though we don't have the capability of resources to help the young people. How do we work with you from here? Uh, now that we are all here, Nigo has brought us here, how do we work with you, especially before elections, during elections, and getting the African young leaders do what you are talking here now? Because peace is for Klopo. How do you partner and how Thank can you. you work with us? Thank you. Get one more question in. Right there? Yeah, there's a mic. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Sylvia Gollenbeck with YSA. Uh, I just want to add one more layer to the, your very, very interesting comments. At YSA, we uh, work to engage children and youth in service to their communities in such a way that the young volunteers and the communities experience positive change. Uh, and as I was listening to your comments, I was struck by the thought that in so many ways, the word sports can can be replaced by the word service. Uh, we seek the same objectives, we have the same values, which uh, is a good uh, grounds to, for collaboration and, and building on, on uh, both fields. And in fact, at YSA, we talk about uh, young people utilizing their passions to uh, serve others, to serve their communities. And so often, we use the example of sports um, in such a way that if a young person uh, loves basketball, or loves to swim, how about using that passion to uh, teach someone else that does not have access to that experience or set up a game to, as a fundraiser uh, for a particular cause in such a way that winning is also associated with helping. Thank you. Thank you. So thoughts on the three comments, questions? I think you should do the peacekeeping one first. Hmm. <laughs> well, so in terms of how we might be able to help, we actually had a call this morning that Moy referenced. Uh, so USAID has, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, they've got a new, it's called a learning lab. And the idea being that we've got all this information around best practices, around curriculum development, around coach training, around m and &E, and it's been a bit dispersed. No one's kind of either known where to find it or there's been yeah. too much stuff. So Maura and her team has developed a learning lab, which you know she can provide maybe offline some more information about how to access it, but it's, and, and it's just getting started. Um, so, and obviously with technology now, um, we can, transmit these learnings to people no matter where they are. So that would be uh, my advice. And in terms of, I'll just go real quick. And yeah, please. Uh, the corporate, I think, I don't think with what we're doing, it's any different. Um, and again, Maury's more of an expert than I am. Um, but I think it's gotta be based on authentic authenticity. 
So rather than quick hits and um, going for publicity, um, if you know, looking at a, a public-private partnership, if it's around something that the corporate it really identifies with, um, if you have leaders from that corporation that are invested into doing this and, and being there for the long term, and if you've got the right NGO partners. Those are at least the elements that I think you need. If it's not based on that, that it's not based on authenticity, it's some you know, quick objective, not only is it not like it'll work, but that whole issue of do no harm, right? It's going to do some harm when you come in, especially you know with with you know short-term money and say we want you to do this. Mm. Um, so that would be from our from my personal lessons of dealing with you know both observing and, and working with our organizations around you know corporate partnerships that are successful. Back on partnerships, I'm sure you have some thoughts I, on this I, piece. I have many thoughts on <laughs> partnerships, but I will keep them brief. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I come at this from the UK side of things, but we've we've had a fantastic working relationship with the Premier League on Premier Skills, and it's because of some of um, the areas that Brendan mentioned. They are heavily invested in the success of this program uh, because it's their brand as well. Um, the Premier League is a great soft power asset for the UK. It draws people in. Um, their coaches come out and... Draws me in every weekend. Yeah, I mean, their coaches Sometime come out week. as part of this program. They go and they train coaches in country to then cascade that training onto Premier Skills. So they're, they're very heavily invested, and um, I would agree wholeheartedly with what Brendan said on that. Um, I think the other key to that is ensuring that you not only have you know, your international NGO partners, but also local partners on the ground that are as invested in this program as you are. Maureen, do you have any? Just anything? really quickly, kind of tying a few of these together. So yeah. on that note, I think um, there's really nothing wrong with uh, corporations wanting to benefit um, from the philanthropic work that they do, and I think that we need to realize that. And so in order to get their sort of sustained involvement and interest, they have, they have shareholders. I mean, they, they can't just go out and just throw money away, and, and that's all it is. So we, especially as donors, um, whether it's government or others, we and, and NGOs who are at the receiving end of it, we need to better um, look at, at, the, at their needs, their business needs and the, their interests and how our objectives, our development objectives and the interests of these NGOs can actually um, further those corporate interests. And as such, we'll get greater commitment from them in a, in a much more sort of long-term perspective. Because I think it is, especially if you're looking at Africa, I mean, I can't think of anywhere in the world that you're thinking about a better hotbed of investments. Um, and I think if we can do that, if we can truly partner with them from, from the very early stages of program development, I think there is a way to actually maximize those interests. I think um, the, the other sort of conversation that was brought up here was the uh, President Obama's initiative. I think you're, you're referring to the um, yeah. YALI, Youth African Leadership mm -hmm. Initiative. Um, and I'll relate that to the service comment um, because this, this initiative is really sort of addressing the youth bulge um, that we're, we're seeing in Africa. And um, the, the basis of it is leadership, but with that comes a strong element of service. Um, and, and we're actually doing a sport-based program um, as one of the sort of, sort of components of YALI in Senegal based on basketball and working in partnership with the NBA. But it really service leadership, all those things are really rolled up in a basketball, um, simply yeah. said. And, and it's taking these, um, these athletes, not professional athletes, not even amateur, these are kids that can come together and actually learn a lot of those things um, to empower them. And these are tomorrow's leaders. And, and how can we do that through sport? This is how we do it. We bring them together and empower them. And as I transition to Tom, just to comment, I was... Um privileged enough to have been in State Department and USAID when the Young African Leaders Initiative was first getting underway. And when we, um, the first program under that, if you will, was bringing 150 young African leaders from the 50, you know, 50 plus countries to the US. And as part of that program, there was a, a service learning experience. We, we can't call it a, a full on sort of volunteer, voluntary experience, but it was the idea of, of service being part of our culture of leadership um, development here. So I think the point will take in. Tom, I know you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think just the, the third question, um, just to kind of add on to that. I mean, I, mean, I think that what you're saying is, is kind of 
the idea of service through sport and vice versa um, is what we're all saying. I think a lot of times it's not, it's not as literal as that, but I think the underlying themes of what we try to get across is, is, are exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, from, from giving, just from the swimming perspective, giving swim clinics around the world with other, um, you know, Olympic athletes who aren't swimmers. Um, you know, being in Europe and in Asia with um, speed skaters or, um, you know, luge athletes or um, archery athletes that are, are giving clinics about sports that they don't even participate in serves the point and proves the point that it's not about the sport that they're doing. I mean, Brendan touched on it too. It's, yes, is it, is it a great outcome that it's a competitive basketball game? Sure. But the reality is that you have to give those, those kids more credit than that because they get that they're working together. They get that the win in it all is they, they see the reality of what can happen when you work together, when you give of yourself and give of your time. Um, and I think that's, that's the nice thing that you see in kind of feet on the ground being a part of those types of, of, uh, of events and organizations is that um, it, isn't, it isn't such a, a distant kind of idea that whether it's a gold medalist or just an athlete who competed in a sport, the kids don't care as much about that. They care that they, what they latch onto is the idea that you have figured something out that they want to figure out, whether that's teamwork, whether that's having a passion for something, whether that's um, having, setting goals and, and really working hard to achieve those. It can be in any arena. It isn't that, I, I think we sometimes don't give those kids enough credit to realize they think outside the box from what you're presenting them. They don't take it so literal to mean that like, I'm gonna do what Tom is saying only in swimming. Um, and a lot of times it has nothing to do with that sport, it's just, as Brent, and Brennan said it well, it's, that opens the door and it keeps the door open before they close it on you to go, wait a second, I'm getting hoodwinked into something that I wouldn't have signed up for before. I didn't like math growing up. How did I do math? My dad raced me in a glass of milk. Okay, let's, let's race and then we'll do, that's how it, it's, it's all leverage points to get into those conversations and I think that what you're saying in, in the, the idea of of adding service into that so that it inspires them is exactly what you do, but that also is kind of where we started when I got here, which was a little bit late, but which is the idea of uh, what is it that you're pulling them into? And as an organization, you have to decide that rather than just hope for the best and go in with you know, great emotion and think that the kids are gonna fully get, well then where does that go? I think that's where, what has to be thought through and then and then you have to stick to that. I think what I have seen just personally is that what you end up having are endeavors that kind of, they try this and then maybe 60% of it works, but then they jump over here and then they jump over here and then they're not identified with one kind of goal in mind. And it seems simplistic, but I think it's very easy and it's true even in small businesses to kind of jump from one thing to the next and the next hot topic as to what works. And, and, and kids, buy, they, they, they read into that. They can sense that. If you're not in it for the long haul, it, that it's, it's, not, it's not true to them. So I think that ties into the corporate side of it too, is that it, it all is very transparent. Well, I can't think of a better note to, to end on um, than that. So um, I hope you'll all join me in thanking Maury, Brendan, Rebecca, and Tom. Um, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, it couldn't be more well-timed. So. Um, I hope it'll, it'll help us all um, go through these games maybe with a, a, different, um, a different thought process and, and, and think about something more than medals, um, although I, uh, of course, am going Team USA. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us. Thanks for folks that were online and on Twitter, and um, uh, stay tuned for more. Thanks.